Well, welcome to another session of our AP Academy Professional Development Series. We're really happy that you all are with us this Friday morning, a beautiful fall Friday morning. It's making me very happy, this cool weather out there. Um, so we are recording this session and we will post it on our website once it has finished its uploading to the cloud. So we'll have it out there. So if there's anything that you see during the session that you want to go back and maybe watch again, or if you wanna share it with others, that link will be available on our website. Uh, my name is Allie Michael. I'm the coordinator for academic services and engagement, and I'll kind of be monitoring the chat box for you today. So if you have any questions, feel free to put those in the chat box and we can answer them. Or since we have a pretty small group, you could also just unmute yourself and, and ask a question as well. Um, we also have Rachel Carroll, who is our office supervisor here with us today, and she'll be helping me with uh, the chat box as well. So you can either post it in there for every to see or you can send us a direct message as well if you would like to. So I'm going to hand it over to our guest speaker for today which is Dr. David Sanchez and I'll let him kind of introduce himself for us and um, and then take it away. So go ahead Dr. Sanchez. Sure and it looks like there's one more in the waiting room. Yep um, just right yeah there we go. <laughs> Well, hi, good, uh, good morning, everybody. Again, uh, I'm David, and um, I am the, um, the ADP Chief Information Officer here at Austin P University. And uh, a little bit about me, uh, about me, I have started, let's see, I started my job here at Austin P on March 9th of this year, which was, which, which if you were teaching in the spring, uh, that was actually spring break for the for the campus. So I started March 9th and then by that Wednesday, maybe that Thursday, the decision was made to go full remote for um, our students extending spring break and then going full remote. And then uh, all the faculty and staff going full remote also. So it was it was an interesting time to start a new job, uh, particularly since I uh, was new to Clarksville, new to APSU and I uh, was unfamiliar with our IT uh, shop here, with, with the, the staffing and the skill sets and the org, org and all those different things. And so it was, it was really interesting. And so um, when the semester started, they asked me, hey, can you do a quick talk to one of our, our academic engagement uh, sessions about um, cybersecurity and sort of the COVID world i guess is what we call it now the, 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 the you know the the remote learning and the COVID. and so i do have some information about that but i um since i i'm not familiar with it with everybody here i understand that most most folks are adjunct faculty and so what i wanted to do first of all oh and i just want to mention too I, i'm coming from texas uh, i was a chief information officer at a university out in texas uh, for a number of years before that i was out in at the university of new mexico in albuquerque new mexico so my background um, it's been in IT for, for quite a while. So, but here at Austin P, if you are familiar with information technology at, at Austin P, we are broken down into really four individual units or departments within uh, IT here. And I'll quickly talk about those. So if, you're, if you aren't familiar with our shop here, but um, the first one that I have listed here is uh, enterprise services. And under that umbrella, we take care, that group takes care of um, our, our, our banner, our, our project management, our applications, our databases. And so anything that you see that you work with at the campus that has to do with, um, well, human resources, so payroll, financial aid, uh, finance, uh, student, all those tools, all that information is kept in our enterprise solution, which is Lucian's uh, banner. And um, that group takes care of the, the doing updates, patches, uh, new programs, uh, hook, any, anything that's a hook in the banner, um, we have to run those projects and get those other systems uh, set up, like there's, there's TouchNet, there's DegreeWorks, there's a whole litany of services that we provide to the campus that is supported by that group. The technical services group 
Um, if you had a problem with a, um, you know, a computer or a peripheral device or anything like that, that unit is who you would call for our help desk. So we have a help, if you don't know, hopefully you do know, we do have a, a help desk and the number is 221-HELP. 221-4357 is the actual number. So if you ever have an issue relating to anything on campus, uh, if you're teaching in a classroom or if you are uh, having issues with a, a, a university device or getting on the network or anything like that, you can call that number or you can go to our GovsTech uh, website and put in a ticket and we'll have somebody reach out to you and, uh, and troubleshoot with you. But we, uh, we, that unit also takes care of all um, a lot of our hardware, our purchasing, and like I said, any device that you might have, um, you have a webcam or a printer or um, really any, anything, any technology piece that you use, whether it's in a classroom or in your office, if you have an office here on campus, uh, we will help you with that if you have any issues. We have another team, our third team is our infrastructure team. And if you didn't know, we have a, um, a data center here on campus, which we maintain. We have servers, we have um, all the infrastructure to support that data center, that team takes care of. They're also responsible for all the wired and wireless uh, connections here on campus, uh, providing those access points, troubleshooting those devices, uh, phones, uh, campus phones, you know, you know, troubleshooting, cabling, new construction, those type of things. So our infrastructure services takes care of a lot of those things on campus and in all the dorms. So any issues that students have along those lines or faculty or staff have, we address those pieces also. And the last team is which we're going to talk about a little bit more today is our uh, information security team. And really a little bit of history here. We have, oh, Stephanie Taylor is our uh, director of our information security and she's been doing that job, I think about three or four years is my understanding. It was um, prior to that, they really didn't have an individual looking at information security for the campus. And so she transitioned in that role a few years back. And just recently, uh, recently as in July, we were able to fill a second position, position in information security. So it's really a small shop, just, just two uh, staff. And um, sometimes we get a graduate student in there is what I understand also. Uh, but what they look at uh, really is how, to we, how do we protect the university from all the bad actors that are out there? How do we support our faculty, staff, and students with um, training so that they understand what the threats are and identifying different threats and um, you know and then if we do happen to have some kind of incident how do we respond to that if, whether it's it, if it's um, and we'll go through some of those later but, but how, you know, how do we mitigate those how do we respond to those when we have an incident and, and, and how do we protect ourselves so we spend a lot of money uh, at the university with uh, hardware. I mean, we have firewalls. We do a lot of um, our own penetration testing, trying to find out our own weaknesses, um, and um, you know, with, with patching and uh, upgrading and keeping things current to protect the bad. Uh, like I said, keep the bad actors from getting in. Um, but as you'll see, a, a lot of that that expense it really depends on. Um, all the different individuals. Everybody on campus potentially is a target, and um, and we'll go through how how some of those bad actors actually get into different systems to talk about that. But what else? So if anybody has a question or a small group, feel free to feel free to, to jump in, and we'll be happy to, to discuss. I do want to make everybody aware that uh, October is uh, Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and now it's October 2nd, so we're in, we're into that. The, this started probably about four or five years ago, maybe a little bit longer. If, if I think back, I, I, I probably should look into it. But um, every October is a Simon Security Awareness Month. And so a lot, you may see some information coming out um, from different areas, but you definitely see some from Stephanie uh, Taylor and our information security group about um, information security. And so we, she has some information she'll be, she'll be pushing out to folks. But it really, it really is a national um, program to get people aware of uh, the threats that are out there and to keep people safe online. So I have this uh, word cloud that I've, not sure where I got it, but I've had it for a while. And when we talk about information security, these are just a lot of the terms that are out there. 
uh, some of the things to be thinking about as we as we as we talk through uh, information security uh, this morning. It, it has a lot to do with protecting information, and so uh, protecting information on a personal level, and then for the university on the university level. And so we really look at at, at both of those. But uh, during this uh, this talk, I, I would want you to think about you know how do you protect yourself also uh, as an individual from these type of threats that are out there. So if you're at home or you are um, you know, at work to be to be thoughtful about the things you see and the and the um, the different ways people try and steal your information. And so uh, there's as you, as you see on here, there's a lot of things that we do to uh, keep information secure. Um, a lot of this information is is what they call PII or, or uh, person, personal identifiable information, and, and you're familiar with. FERPA and HIPAA and those type of things, keeping that information protected, safe, and protecting the individuals whose information that is um, from having their information um, exposed or, or um, used and put out there on the dark web or and used in other ways. So uh, personal information keeps up confidential. On here we have terms like uh, email. Email is a big, uh, mechanism for bad actors to try and get uh, information and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, personal information we protect against uh, uh, viruses different vulnerabilities vulnerabilities that we have spam malware all these different pieces are things we, we, we put protections in place to keep that stuff off of our systems um, whether through hardware or software to do those type of things and so um, that's sort of the umbrella of what we're, we're going to be talking about today the I did want to mention because I was just thinking about this the other day. Uh, there's been some some data breaches here recently. Even some, in, I think I, I do have a slide about that. You know, there's even been some things in Montgomery County and in, and in Tennessee that have happened. But um, most of you probably are aware or have been impacted in some way, shape, or form to some of these really big, large data breaches that have happened. And um, I, I, you can do a quick search and I found that I went through the top 10 and this is a handful of the top 10 that some of you may be familiar with. But when you look at this, um, you know, going back to like 2013, Adobe um, had a data breach where 150 million users records were out there. This adult friend finder, I'm not sure what that is really. I wasn't familiar with it until I saw this, but there was a lot of records that were, uh, impacted uh, you know 412 million accounts and I, i'm not really sure what that does but um what that that tool is but it's probably like one of those um either a dating site or just a friend site ebay was impacted and and um again 145 million users equifax which is just a few years ago a, a lot of us are probably you've probably heard of equifax before because they um had so it was it was it was it was very visible. Um, it was on all the news. I was I was actually personally impacted by this Equifax breach, and they had to pay for um, uh, credit monitoring. I think is the right terminology that we had for a number of years. I think it was a year's worth of uh, that type of uh, service. That um, if you had any any type of if your information was used inappropriately, they would monitor that for you. And um, Heartland payment systems, LinkedIn, if you use LinkedIn, they've had some of their accounts used uh, out there, their uh, user accounts. The Heartland payment system one, that was 134 million credit cards. And uh, you know, some of this has different levels of information that they share, but to have all your credit cards out there is that's really unfortunate. <laughs> that's really unfortunate because um, that stuff gets once once this data gets uh, taken, it can be out there forever. You know, um, really, like I mentioned on the dark web. But so if you haven't, I guess what I'm trying to get to the point here with this sharing some of these examples is if you haven't already had some of your information out there, it, it's probably out there somewhere in some way, shape, or form. Um, you know, maybe not your credit card, but some of your personal information is, is likely floating around there somewhere. And, and again, there's so many minor data breaches that 
It's just amazing how much information is already, already out there. What I would like to say, though, is um, we do have a framework. So in our uh, information security, we, we follow what is um, known as the NIST cybersecurity framework. And NIST, NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. NIST has a lots of different um, policies and recommendations that you follow. It's, it's not just information security related, but it's, it, there's, there's lots of different uh, NIST uh, guidelines that we follow. But for information security, we follow their guidelines. So if, if there is some kind of um, incident, these are the, these are, this is a framework that we use. And so um, in our information security, we're always looking to identify any threats, protect, detect, respond, recover. Those, those pieces are what builds our uh, cybersecurity framework. So if there is an incident, well, first of all, we're, we're trying to protect everything, but once in a while something gets in and when it does, um, you know, we have to identify those who those bad actors are, what they've done, what information have they had access to, uh, you know, um, respond to those events. We've been, we've had a few incidents here, but we've been fairly fortunate um, about um, being able to mitigate some of those uh, uh, intrusions that we've had and um, Sometimes you, sometimes you do you a good job of getting it in there early and stopping some of these attacks, but essentially, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's tricky because when it comes to information security, it is a 24 seven operation where folks are always trying to break in. It's like, um, well, I guess what would be an example. So you think about now, now in your home environment, you have cameras and you have doorbell cameras and you have security alarms. And, um, you know, you have somebody, come, if somebody comes to break in your door at, at, you know, at noon and it's locked and you've kept them out, then they go around to the back door, they go around to the window. Somebody is doing that at the front door, at the back door, at the window, 24 seven to our operations. And um, we have to be very diligent to make sure that we are um, doing our best to keep those actors out, bad actors out. It really is a lot of work and um, there are no breaks. <laughs> there are no breaks involved with that. The, uh, as far as uh, Stephanie and her shop, there are, uh, and this sort of goes along with the uh, the previous slide, but we do have a information uh, technology security plan. So we have a lot of plans in place. So when we do have an incident um, and, and how to protect our our, uh, our data from it. And uh, we, we have a lot, believe it or not, the state does a lot of audits on our uh, infrastructure, on our uh, processes, on our access control who has access to certain accounts, who doesn't, making sure we're removing people when they don't need access. Um, we do audits regularly, um, not just of IT. Uh, last year, there was a, an audit for all of information technology, but um, you know, each year, different parts of the university are audited, and more and more IT is involved in those audits because everything now is technology-based or all the data is on our, on our servers and in our, on our infrastructure. But um, some of the things that we do, we do, we do, we do, do risk assessments. We identify risks on campus. Um, we look at vulnerabilities and we, and we are always thinking about how we reduce the threat, all the threats that are out there on campus. We do have, a, a, I mentioned a little bit before, our, our incident response and recovery. And we have a plan that we activate each time there's an incident and depending on the level of that incident, how do we escalate it? How do we communicate to people who's involved? Um, those type of things. Uh, we are doing cyber uh, security awareness. Uh, so one of the things that um, they do here is, is they, there is, like when I just started, I mentioned I started in March, there is a information security part of the initial training for the campus when you become a new employee. Um, I think that's something that was carried over from, from the, um, when, we, when uh, Austin P was, under the umbrella of the Tennessee Board of Regents. And um, it really needs to be updated. And so we've actually worked to um, 
worked with a vendor, it's called Nova 4, that we're going to be improving our information security training for the campus. Uh, it's online training and, um, and make that available. It might be something that's part of the annual training assessment. We're hoping that that's the case. We're thinking that it, it needs to be. Um, and uh, folks, uh, you know, faculty and staff would be able to go in and take the training. And it's pretty good. I had, we had it uh, when, at my previous institution uh, in Texas. We had that training and um, it really just keeps people um, diligent and in information security at the forefront of their minds because, you know, people get busy, uh, particularly faculty and staff with their day and um, it just takes one one incident really to compromise us in, in some serious ways. So that's that's happening. Um, and we, you know, that last bullet there is information security, security five. So we, we collaborate with a lot of different areas too, lots of departments. So sometimes, I mean, the, the incidents aren't always, you know, with IT. A lot of times the incidents are with a user in a different department and we have to figure out, um, you know, when they were compromised, how long their account was compromised, what did the uh, you know, attacker have access to, was it any, any critical data, those type of things. And so we collaborate to make sure that we're, we are um, working with other departments to make sure we're, we're as secure as we can be. Uh, this is a slide that I've, I've used previously uh, in, in other presentations over the years. And I, I thought, well, you know, this is a, a slide about some some kind of uh, you know hacker trying to get into uh, some system, but you know, in the days of of uh, COVID nineteen, you know, he's just a regular guy now, just like all of us in our masks, um, trying to probably do his schoolwork, could be a student, could be anybody, and um, anybody really can be a threat out there. And so I thought that was interesting when they said, hey, can we talk about you know, COVID and uh, information security. I thought, well, this guy may not be the best picture anymore because he's, he's everybody now. But um, I want to talk a little bit about cybercrime in the COVID area, era, era. <laughs> get that right. I did, uh, I was doing some, uh, some research and uh, you all might be familiar with some of these things. If you were, uh, you know, some of these things you may have encountered actually during this time uh, since we all went remote in COVID, but I looked at some of the FBI the FBI actually has a crime uh, complaint center and some of the information I've gathered from there is the number of complaints has, has risen significantly. You, you can see there that um, typically they receive about a thousand complaints a day and that was increased to about three or four thousand a day during, um, well, starting in March when we went, we went full COVID. Um, There was a quote there saying that uh, we are seeing a 75% spike in daily cyber crimes. That was uh, reported by the FBI since the start of the pandemic. Um, if you were, well, those have been pretty good increases and it's across the board. Malware, ransomware, social engineering, phishing, all those things saw an uptick. You, you would see, you, we saw an uptick and um, and I always call them bad actors. Bad actors setting up fraudulent domains, fake charities, um, masks that you could purchase that were, you know, were sort of bogus uh, websites, different equipment. And so there are a lot of folks who are trying to use COVID-19 um, really to benefit themselves financially or just really to cause havoc and, and uh, you know, around the, around the U.S. and around the globe. Just... Uh, yeah, just Tuesday I saw an article, so I threw I threw this in here. The um, there was a cyber attack. The headline was "Cyber Attack Hobbles Major U.S. Hospital Chains, U.S. Facilities, Staff Force Use Paper Records." And that article was just from Tuesday on the 29th. They are hackers were looking to just disrupt systems. Hackers were looking to steal our COVID research. Um, if you saw that in the news, that they were trying to trying to really hit healthcare really hard get that information and, um, and, and steal it. Uh, and then, you know, just causing problems where, you know, it really impacts when it comes to healthcare, you know, life and death situations. I, I, I heard something that there was actually somebody died. Oh, I can't, I, I don't remember the context now, but there was some kind of cyber incident where somebody was trying to get medical care. And because there was such a slowdown, they ended up um, uh, 
you know, passing away from the incident they were having. And so it really does have major impacts um, on, um, you know, on individuals and on organizations for sure. The other thing that if you are teaching uh, online in the spring or even this fall, uh, we've, we've looked to say, put safeguards in place to avoid this, but Zoom bombing, so Zoom is being used. So if you had stock in Zoom before, um, before we all went remote, you probably made quite a bit of money uh, because the uh, utilization is in just skyrocketed. Um, and uh, educational institutions, businesses, government, everything went, we went online, Zoom became a major player. And we saw pretty quickly that people started taking advantage of, of that because a lot of these Zoom meetings, well, you know, were not either password protected or were just open or they put the link on a public website and anybody could click on that link and get in. And so what we were seeing, um, and it happened in, in um, we had an incident here and it happened in a lot of universities uh, early on was that people would go in and just disrupt the class or do something inappropriate or, or put something inappropriate on the screen and, and, and really just disrupt the, um, the education environment for all the students and so there are um, it, it, our distance education does a great a pretty good job here with all uh, the uh, the distance learning they did put in uh, parameters for controlling some of that so hopefully, you know hopefully people still have avoided doing um, you know, putting public links and those type of things out there but zoom has actually made some changes also to improve that so um, this is slide is really busy and so I won't get into it all, but one of the things I wanted to focus on, this gives you an idea, and, and, and this was put together by uh, um, a group that does information security, and so uh, there's quite a few of these out there, but it's, it's really busy, like I mentioned, and I won't get into all of it. I just wanted to focus on like one little slice, but you can see here, this is just some of the countries that are getting hit, hit kind of hard, some of the weakest links that we have here. Um, uh, at the bottom it says access of evils, malware, phishing, ransomware, um, account takeovers, those type of things are some of the big things that, are, that have been hitting us and that we are really looking to protect ourselves from. But I wanted to focus on, and I, I just made it sort of bigger and blew it up here, a, a little bit is a ransomware. And um, if you're not familiar with ransomware, ransomware is um, really has, has been increasing significantly over the last few years. Um, you've seen some, um, there's been some public cases. There's, uh, as you see the numbers here, you can tell um, organizations are being more and more impacted by ransomware. And uh, so what ransomware, I guess real quickly, if people aren't familiar with it, is what ransomware is, is um, basically bad actors get into your system and once they get in, they will um, encrypt all your files. And so if you have important files or you're really anything that you use, they, they aren't really looking necessarily to, to steal your data. What they're looking to do is keep you from accessing your data. And when they encrypt it, um, they'll encrypt every single file and say you have a folder, every file in there would be encrypted and you will not be able to break that encryption. And so what they do is essentially they, they then say, okay, you can have, we'll encrypt them for you and give them all back to you, but you have to pay a certain dollar amount. And um, the reason it works is because people pay the ransoms. And um, because a lot of times it's cheaper to pay that ransom than the effort it takes to try and um, rebuild your infrastructure, if that's what they've done. Uh, if they've taken, I mean, because there's lots of different files. It's, it's not just necessarily all your, you know, Word files or Excel files, but they can they can encrypt lots of different types of, of files to to really do some some significant damage to systems. But um, it's increasing because they're making money at it, and um, it's it's more and more of a threat. The the slide here shows you that who they're hitting uh, and uh, government organizations uh, have been the hardest hit. We had, I mean, I, I looked, I, I do have a slide for it, but I'll mention it, is the, um, 
Like in 2017, Montgomery County had a ransomware attack. And from that article, it's just a news article said that they had paid some amount to, to encrypt them. And then there was an issue last weekend. I'm not sure if it's a ransomware because it hasn't come out yet, but it looked like it might have been ransomware. Um, and so government org organizations really are one of the bigger targets for um, you know, these, these types of attacks. Uh, manufacturing, construction, and, and education is in there also, healthcare education. Um, we see this more and more. Any, any place where they see they can um, you know, penetrate through a system, they are going to look at and try and try and exploit. Now, usually they're looking at companies and, and you know, where they can make some money. It's, it's on an individual level, unless you, you know, own a small company or a small business, likely they would, you would be a, a target of ransomware. Usually it's the bigger organizations, but I guess if they can make some money, they'll, they'll try it anywhere. Um, and so this is, a, this is a concern because ransomware is a concern because if you look at sort of these numbers here, how do they get into our systems? And there's, a, there's a, like I said, there's a lot of different ways to get in our systems. We protect against all these, you know, like I said, we protect all our front door, back door windows. And um, one of the things that's hard to do is, uh, and, I, and I mentioned we're all targets, is if somebody lets them in. And that, and that can happen um, really through a process of social engineering that we've seen. And so you can, we can spend all the money on all the hardware and all the software to protect our systems. But if a bad actor gets to an individual uh, through deception or through spam or a phishing email and the individual then um, you know, either follows that link and, and provides their credentials or gives uh, information out that, that they shouldn't be and then that bad actor then uses their credentials, gets into the system and then really once they're in they can look to try and you know, go vertical throughout the network and, and get into our servers and get into other areas. So. Um, we have to be diligent as individuals from, from watching out for these things, but you can see that, uh, you know, uh, training is important, weak passwords. Well, I have a slide about passwords, we'll talk a little bit about those. Um, but there's just a lot of different avenues that they try to get, but really a, 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 big, a big factor is through, you get an email or you get, you know, a, 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 a spam or phishing emails really they call it spear phishing spear phishing emails are something that's really directed so sometimes you can get an email that's from uh the the chair or the dean or the president of the university that, that's they use the right headers they use the right fonts um, but the links that they provide um, are are fraudulent links and you once you click on those you're going to something that's either a malware or trying to trick you into giving up your credentials. Um, so really be really be focused on the emails. And we do, uh, Stephanie does send out um, phishing emails periodically as a training tool. So if you see it um, and you click on it uh, by mistake, it'll, it'll say, hey, this, watch for this. That's a bad uh, uh, email. It's not, it, it, it's not coming from the user who, um, who, is, who, who it looks like it's coming from. So there's a lot of things to look forward in emails that are um, inappropriate that clue you in. But we block, you'd be amazed at the number of emails we actually block. So when one or two of those gets through, um, it's out of the you know hundreds of thousands that we blocked that day already. And so we do a pretty good job of filtering those emails, but the, um, the bad actors get, get pretty, uh, they get they, they keep changing their tactics also to, to get through our, our filtering system so um, it's always an issue but if you do ever have an, uh, an email that looks suspicious just sort of trust your instincts on that if it looks uh, or if it's promising you something that, uh, that you know doesn't seem uh, uh, if, if, if it's promised you something that it's that you, that really what i'm trying to say that it's too good to be true i guess it's it's good it's likely spam, if it looks unusual. Um, a lot of times they come, like I said, if they do some um, really focused emails, things from, they, they make it look like they're from Amazon or they're from Google or something like that. So you, you, you just gotta be thoughtful. If it, if it seems like something is unusual or off, it, like it is, you can, it, you can, if you do have a concern, you can forward that email. We have a phishing 
uh, you can forward that in or you can contact information security. Sometimes you actually you get something that's legitimate that looks kind of fishy and we can check that for you too. Um, so uh, we've had emails come from certain areas and they're really legit emails, but for some reason they look very suspicious, but they're legit. We can verify that legitimacy of some of those um, front for you. So this, so we're talking about ransomware. If you ever see something like this, you're in bad shape. <laughs> um, this was from the WannaCry uh, ransomware that came out um, a few years ago. Uh, it it's, looks kind of ugly and looks, looks a little scary, but essentially what this is, and this is how they do it. So they will uh, encrypt your files. You'll get uh, a pop-up like this on your screen. It'll say, hey, you want to recover your files, go through these steps. You need to pay us um, with Bitcoin. And if we don't receive your payment by you know, a certain time, your files will be lost. If you do, um, we can decrypt them for you and you, and you get it back. So this WannaCry virus impacted, this was a very, very big ransomware um, that hit, uh, well, I guess it says that 2017, this screen capture was from. But um, you know, these folks will either, either encrypt your information and make it unaccessible, or they'll take your information also and put it out on the dark web, and eventually you'll, you'll start um, the bad actors on the dark web will start using that information to, um, to try and exploit the university or to make money or um, just to cause havoc. So if you ever see one of these, let us know immediately. What else? Oh, I just had mentioned there's a couple of ransomware incidents in Montgomery County. Uh, so they're here and they're out there and uh, there are um, they're trying to they have the, they're, they're trying to get into APSG also. So we got to be very diligent. What else? Oh, I did want to talk just a little bit um, about passwords and passphrases. The, we have a requirement here at uh, APSG for which is a minimum of eight characters, which that's just a minimum. <laughs> Our recommendation is you have more than eight digits and, and maybe that's something we'll look at here in the in the near term is to see if we can change that requirement um, because it doesn't take that long for um for, for some of the shorter passwords to get hacked and that and i'll show you a little bit about that but one of the things that is really helpful is is really long the longer the password or passphrase the longer, the longer it is, the, it's the strength and the time to crack that um, password are exponentially increased. Um, so if you start thinking in sentences, uh, as far as far as putting your passphrases and passwords together, um, like the one down here, I think that's. I was trying to read it. There's an example here. It says thinking in sentences, and that is um, a journey song. If you're familiar with journey. Just a small town girl living in a lonely world. Give me that train going anyway. Now that's pretty long. I mean, if you could, if you could remember that. But it's a mix of up, uppercase, lowercase uh, letters, or upper and lowercase letters, and uh, numbers and, and symbols. And um, it definitely is a good idea to include a mix of those in any of your passwords um, for your university and then for your home, all the different passwords you have for all your different um, services that you use online. Uh, oh, I had a quick slide here. And I know the thing on the right is probably hard to see, small print, and I know my eyes are going. But um, some of these passwords are, are really don't take that much time to crack. There is a, a link here to, and I think the slides will be out there. So you could, if, if, you could just Google it, how secure is my password. There are some tools out there that you can click on. And don't type in your password if you type in a, a a similar password that is sort of what your password is, it'll tell you how long it takes to crack that. Just going, uh, oh, if you look at my little slide here, just going from eight to nine characters in a passcode really increases the time to crack. Um, and, uh, you know, if you have 10 plus, it's going to be really hard for anybody to just, as a, as a brute force attack, to try and crack your password. They, uh, they won't be able to do that. Again, don't, 
don't use these simple passwords. Don't use anything that's just just text or you know the biggest uh, the most used passwords are uh, you know the word password itself or you know one two three four five. The, all those things they're not even it's not even having a password like that isn't even um, you might as well not even have a password <laughs> something like that. But just know that the longer and the more complex, the more safe you are. Particularly, I mean, with your university accounts for sure, but you know, a lot of people do their 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 banking on the web. They do their um, you know portfolios on the web. You want to definitely want to keep uh, those things as secure as possible. So password strength and passphrase length is really important. And I know I'm doing a lot of talking here, and I can't believe it's already been sort of 44 minutes. Uh, just a few tips. Keep your software up to date. So if you, um, we try and do, we do this for university-owned equipment, but you know, I think a lot of adjuncts have, you know, I don't know how well we supply our adjuncts. Probably not well enough for sure. Uh, but your home personal devices, make sure you're running those updates. Um, there's usually patches. If you're on a Windows machine, generally every Tuesday or so, there'll be different patches that come up. Make sure you use the antivirus tools. There are some free antivirus tools. If you don't have any, or you're not somehow protected, you can go to, and, and from our uh, GovTech website, there's a couple that uh, we recommend, um, but use that up. You just need one, just one antivirus tool. Um, so again, keep, the, keep that malware and, and those bad actors from trying to get on your personal devices. Strong passwords, passphrases is important. Uh, I talked about phishing a little bit. Um, be aware of those. Also, be careful on public Wi-Fi. A lot of people don't. You know, any public Wi-Fi, you just jump on and use their Wi-Fi. Those uh, that Wi-Fi is not secure, and so there are uh, some risks involved when you get on that Wi-Fi. Just make sure you're you're you're, you're aware of. Um, you know, people can access if you're typing your passwords or going to your people can hack those things through a public Wi-Fi. And uh, I said this a couple times, but everyone's a target, so please, please understand that. And I think, oh, one last slide. October is Cybersecurity cyber security Awareness Month, along with Halloween and Pumpkin Spice. Um, and I think that's it. That's it. So I just wanted to make sure I had some time. If anybody had any questions or thoughts, I, I know I kind of zoomed through, but it, I'm, I'm happy to try and answer questions or um, discuss anything along these lines. So it looks like we have a question in the chat box for you, David. Oh. Um, uh, what is your opinion of a service like LifeLock? Oh, um, so LifeLock, uh, I, that, that's one of the services where, so if I'm, I'm not that familiar with LifeLock, is that a, that's a tool that's used for, um, Basically, protection like insurance, like like insurance against your your uh, data being out. I think that's what I think that's what it, what it what it is. Yeah, uh, uh, Melissa, are you able to unmute yourself? And if you are, I'm, sure I'm answering the right question. <laughs> There's a few different. Yeah, questions. can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm kind of in a strange place, so I didn't know if you could hear me or not. Uh, yeah, LifeLock is a, a service that they started a long time ago, just looking at people getting their social security start, you know, stolen. And then it has morphed into more than that. They monitor credit. They yeah. uh, they have partnered now with Norton. Yeah. Um, so yes, it is that kind of service. Yeah. It kind of monitors things for you and lets you know if there's a problem. It lets you know when there's a, a major breach, so you can you know see if you were affected by that breach and that. Yeah, no. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, um, uh, those credit monitoring tools. Um, I mean, they're good tools. I have, um, like I mentioned, when I when my data was breached, they provided the year of that time. It was it wasn't LifeLock. It was a different type of service. Um, for monitoring that for you, but uh, yeah, and I actually, to be honest, I did get several notices um, that uh, from that about some issues that had come up with you know my data being out there. So I absolutely think that um, if your data is breached, and generally it's the obligation of the company to provide that service um, out uh, if 
if their data is breached. So like, like I said, with Equifax, they provided it. And so, um, you know, providing those services yourselves is that, you know, I think that's a great idea to have your, uh, to protect yourself from them because it's, like I said, it's going to get out there um, and it's good to have somebody else watching out for you. So I think that's, those are great tools. Another thing that that's, um, and maybe I, I neglected to mention this, but another thing that's really been growing also is insurance for cyber incidents. And so universities, uh, governments, a lot of folks are, uh, getting insurance that covers these types of liabilities. We have some here at Austin B State University. Um, most governments do. And so when we talk about ransomware, a lot of times when they get paid, it's get paid through, you know, an insurance company or, or, or somebody else at times if you don't have the right off insurance. But um, it's getting to those types of levels to try and deal with these, um, these attacks. Anyhow, uh, let's see, any other questions or comments? Yes, I have one. Yeah. Hey, uh, since uh, Awesome Pay does not provide uh, laptops for the adjuncts, can we get some uh, antivirus software? Can we get something from Awesome Pay to put on our personal equipment? So there are, if, if you go to the GovTech website, there is, um, that they, when last I checked it, which was, uh, I don't know, a week or two ago, there, there's, there are a couple links to a couple different tools. And it's just GovTech. If you just Google GovTech uh, uh, antivirus, there's a couple tools that you can go to. And um, I guess it's uh, we've vetted those. I'm not familiar with the tools, but they've, they've been vetted. So so you can use them for your own personal device to, to do that. So uh, I posted I that link, uh, William. Oh. I posted that link in the chat box. Oh, there. Okay. okay. That'll take you to that to that page. Okay. Great. Right. And if you have more questions, yeah, you can put in the help ticket. We can work with you if there's any other problems along, along that. But yeah, I encourage you to do that. And William, I'm also going to make a note of that. Um, since our office is, is relatively new and we've started providing support for adjuncts and part-time instructors, um, we're kind of getting a feel for needs of our adjunct instructors. And so I'm just going to jot that down as, as something um, that maybe we want to look into for future reference. Right, and the reason I ask that is because when I click on email to class and I send an email to my class, I only did it once, but the email went through my Hotmail account. And so it was getting mixed up the Austin, through the Austin B, but it got mixed up with my Hotmail. Um, so uh, it's maybe some setting that I have or, or something, I don't yeah but i don't want all of that getting mixed up no so, well our contacts were getting mixed up with all con everything was getting mixed up and that's not good no 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 yeah you should uh, i mean yeah using your apsu emails that you know for any um that was yeah can campus because because you you should get like the announcement should go through through apsu like the govs tech all that stuff should be going to your your uh, apsu email and yeah. yes, keep those separate. Keep I've, been using, yeah. I've been using my iPhone ever since then. I'm, this old laptop that I'm using is just, I'm, I'm not sending emails to it at all now. Yeah, probably, yeah. No, that's a good idea. Anything else? I think we got a couple minutes. Well, I hope this was uh, educational or informational or something for you all because. Um, uh, I hope I made good use of your time. If there are, if you do have any other questions or concerns or anything, like I said, technology related, Gov's Tech is our website. Jump on there, you can send us an email, you can fill out a ticket online, or you can call that help desk number and um, we'll have a tech help you with whatever you need, okay? Yeah, and I, I wanna plug their, their website is really helpful. Um, they have lots of how-to guides on there. Um, if you follow that link that I posted in the chat, that will take you directly to the antivirus page, but you can also get on there to, uh, to kind of look at some of the other services that are on there as well. So I highly recommend it. I've used it quite a few times myself. So, <laughs> um, so it's, a good, it's a good resource for you to use moving forward. Well, any last questions for David or for any of us about IT or other issues?
All right. Well, I will post this, um, this video on our website and I'll also post those slides, David, if you wouldn't mind sending them my way and I'll be sure to post those. There was lots of great information on there. Thank you for, for creating those. And, um, and if anybody has questions, please feel free to email either myself uh, or our office email that, that you received this information for this meeting on. Um, and I'm sure David wouldn't mind you emailing him as well if you have future questions. Absolutely. Well, thank you for inviting me. Appreciate it. Yes, thank you for joining us. And thank you, everybody, so much for coming. And uh, please join us for our future sessions. We'll be sure to send those out to you as, as, as they come up. All right. Have a wonderful weekend. Enjoy the fall weather. <laughs> Bye now. Thanks. Bye-bye, everyone.